don't know what's going on. It's not showing this this part. It's not counting down. Oh, there we go. Okay. In time for the uh, Greetings. Greetings. Welcome hey. to Kelly Chronicles. Hi, how are you this evening? I'm great, how are y'all? Great, great. 
Welcome to Caregiver Chronicles Friday Night Live, Ask Dr. Yvette Anything. Caregiver Chronicles, let me tell you a little bit about it, is a uh, 16-module online course for caregivers, uh, and it covers all areas of caregivers, all the way from the, the, the onset of your loved one's illness until they uh, recover from that illness or they transition. Um, it is uh, available to you at any given moment, and tonight, we have some special guests on with us tonight. Um, we have uh, asked Dr. Yvette anything. We have uh, Dr. Letitia Sam. She is a pharmacy doctor, and she is the founder and CEO of the nonprofit Ask Pharmacist, Ask Pharmacist Tish, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. And um, she is a graduate of the Medical University of Southern Car South Carolina in, in Charleston. Um, she has been a practicing pharmacist in her community for over 20 years and with her first job working in a pharmacy uh, since the tender age of 16 years old, she has a total of 30 plus years of experience as a pharmacist. So uh, I want to thank you, uh, Tish, as she said, it's okay to call her, for joining us tonight. And we also have a special guest on as well. Uh, her name is Carolyn Hope, and she's actually uh, sharing with us tonight. She is. She, you want to introduce yourself, Miss Hope? Would you like to do that? You, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. Let me unmute you. Okay. okay. Go, go ahead now. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be on with you tonight. Um, well, I, I'm just going to say that I'm the caregiver arm of this uh, discussion. Right. I'm sure the uh, pharmacist, she gets a lot of uh, inquiries about what's good, what's not good. And I know that as a caregiver, it's a major concern for me because um, I try to make sure that uh, all of my uh, patients and clients take their medication. But not only take it, but take it uh, in the proper manner. So uh, right. the pharmacist is certainly somebody that uh, is important in, in, in terms of the aspect of my work. So I am certainly here to learn and to find out um, if there are some things out there that I don't know, because I'd love to be able to take uh, those things back to my clients and uh, be able to share. Right, right. That's really important. So let me tell you about our segment tonight. Our segment tonight is basically to talk about understanding medication. Um, it's critical. It's a critical piece of caregiving when you are caring for a loved one or someone that you are overseer for, knowing how to administer that medication, knowing what that medication is for, being able to monitor that medication, being able to dispose of that medication in other areas, reconciling medication, all of those things are important when you are uh, dealing with a loved one or taking care of someone. And so I asked, um, Dr. Tish, and I'm going to call her Dr. Tish because I like to put a cap on folks' name. She said I could just call her Tish, but I'm going to call her Dr. Tish, okay? So I asked Dr. Tish to join us tonight so that we could talk about some things related to pharmacy, and it's very important for uh, our listeners tonight. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, please type them in the chat as we go along. So uh, thank you again, um, Dr. Tish, for joining us tonight. Um, I want to just talk about pharmacy duties. If you want to just kind of give us a little overview of, of what, you know, what it means to be a pharmacist, if you will. Right, sure. So um, the pharmacist is a part of the healthcare team. Um, so we serve the patients. We make sure um, the patients get their medications uh, the proper way. So, you know, we work along with the doctors. We work along with nurses. We're, we're basically the last pit stop of the healthcare team. So that usually starts with the doctor and it usually will end with us. Um, so basically that's um, where we fit into the whole spectrum of healthcare. Uh, as for our duties, a lot of people have the misconception that all we do is just sling pills in a bottle and get it on its way. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really not that simple um, because one pill can dramatically change your whole life um, for the good or it can dramatically change your whole life um, for the worse. Um, so we're just basically um, here to just be safe, to go by rules and regulations, um, you know, read what the doctor wants us to dispense to the patient. Um, a lot of times where it's more complicated, 
you know, everyone is human. Um, we yeah. make mistakes. Of course, the doctors can make mistakes. So we make sure that those things are correct. Um, sometimes patients may see doctor, different doctors. So we make sure um, a lot of times our records are, as you, you know, want to know about reconciliation, make sure all of that is reconciled. Make sure, um, you know, there are no, not any drug interactions, stuff of that nature. Um, so basically, we um, serve the patient by dispensing medications and making sure they are safe. All right. Sounds great. Sounds great. So now, how important is it that the caregiver, we're going to speak from a caregiver perspective first, and then we'll talk about a patient. Of course, they're, you know, intertwined, if you will, um, knowing the medication and its purpose. Because sometimes, and, and, and I've been guilty of this too, and I, I haven't been guilty of it, but I know of patients that I've had that they will have a medication that they're taking and they don't have a clue about what that medication is, what it's right. doing, and what it's for. And I'm like, well, you got to ask questions, you know what I mean? And so that kind of scares me a little bit. Uh, but so what, how important is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, you made a very good um, statement point. It's amazing that people can leave the, the doctor's office and don't have a clue of what they're being treated for. They have no clue. Right. Um, so, so definitely the caregiver, a lot of times, they're not going to have a clue. So um, we're just basically, you know, there to kind of, and a lot of times we can be used more to help kind of clean, clean out the, mis you know, not the misconceptions, but right. just kind of from what's going on uh, right. with the health and the medication. So it's, it's very important that the caregiver um, know about the medications. We do get a lot of phone calls a lot of, oops, Laura gave this medication, or what is this for? So mm -hmm. um, pharmacists, we are a free resource. You can call any pharmacy. All of us are, you know, by the board of, you know, pharmacy, we are all regulated. So our knowledge base use is gonna be about the same. Of course, season one, like me, they don't, we don't know a little bit more in a lot of cases, but yeah, we are a free resource. So it shouldn't be any guessing on what are you taking, how it should be taken, because you can call any pharmacy uh, and really get that kind of information. But that does happen a lot, even with nurses that are at home with the patient. Um, you know, just a lot of, you know, it's just not any clarity on exactly what should be happening with the patient on medication. Right, so. right. Let me ask you a question. question. Let, me, let me ask you a question, um, Dr. Tish. Do you have on a uh, uh, on a speakerphone or something? I hear an echo. That's why I'm asking you. I want to make sure we we can hear you pretty good, but we have a little bit of an echo. Oh, so, I'm sorry. Now I'm speaker, but I can put on a headpiece if you want me to. <laughs> oh, you okay? I just want. I just hear a little bit of an echo. It might be the the room, the the dimensions of the room. I don't know, but I just hear a little echo. Are you hearing her okay, Miss Carolyn? Yes, and I have a question for her as well. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, my my question is, um, um, in terms of the role of the pharmacist, uh, I'm not sure sometimes um, when the patient uh, has uh, specific uh, directions for medication and the food that they eat, is it the call of the pharmacist to decide um, the best interaction or is that something that's basically left up to the doctor? Um, I, I'm thinking in terms uh, specifically when patients are really into uh, herbs and things that they believe will holistically uh, help them. Whose call is that? Is that uh, something that I could pick up the phone on their behalf and just call the pharmacist and they could say, well, yeah, you know, because uh, on the medication, there's right. no direction regar uh, regarding food. So right. I don't know, is that is that a doctor call or is that a pharmacist call mm -hmm. or it, it's either or? Okay, um, it's an either or, um, but as you know, um, that's a great question. Um, the pharmacist is much more accessible, um, but yeah, we did study that for the whole entire um, time in pharmacy school with interaction. So it's definitely something um, you can give us a call about. Now, if you want to call a doctor and get an answer like, you know, 48 hours later, that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times you can give a response. <laughs> but a lot of times you can give us a call. Well, 100% of the time you can give us a call. 
um, if we can give you that information. Yes, because a lot of times, as you know, like medications, let's say like a blood thinner, like Coumadin or the generic yes. Walkerin, that has like a plethora of interactions. It's like you can't exactly. even breathe air without being an interaction with Coumadin. Like I said, which yes. is a, um, a old time blood thinner. Um, so definitely stuff like that we can answer. Um, so definitely we, that's something we can, we can take care of. Oh. All right. Easily. So, so I, I recall uh, there being a directive about not eating grapefruit when you are yes. taking some type of blood pressure medication. Is that, is there a specific medication or is it, uh, you know, right. how does that work? Do you, you know, do, is it for anyone who's taking that medicine or is it for specific people or what is the... Right. Um, so it's basically the characteristic of the medication. So I know like a lot of times with cholesterol medications, for example, um, there is an interaction where it will bind to the medic, the grape will bind to the medication and make it less effective. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times uh, interactions can happen where they build up the medications in the bloodstream and make it toxic. So mm -hmm. um, in the case of, you know, with this speaking of grape food, um, can make the medication less effective. So it's not a person by person basis. It's okay. more so the characteristic of the medication um, basis on that one. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Well, my, my concern is about um, uh, high blood pressure and uh, people eating beets as part of their salads because it's my understanding that beets have nitrates, which can also affect uh, uh, high blood pressure medication, but I know that they're common and they are definitely common uh, in salads. So is uh -huh. that, uh, it's, um, is that something to be concerned about or is it because it's in a salad and, and you're not eating a lot of it uh, uh -huh. that it's okay to, to mix it in concern if you have a uh, high blood pressure medication that you're taking and several different kinds. Right. Uh -huh. um, with that, uh like if you're dealing with, um, like we say, a blood pressure medication or nitrates, uh, people will have like the um, the angina or the you know chest pain. Um, so you don't want like a buildup of that. Um, in that case, it's probably more so negligible. It's really not a deal. Um, usually, the medications you don't want to have any kind of mix up with is the like I said, the, the blood thinners um, because those show itself fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the Joxin, um, also for like congestive heart failure, that can throw the heart rhythm off. So those are the two main, I mean, it's a whole lot more, but those are the ones you really don't want any kind of interactions with. Everything else is pretty negligible. It's not really a, a big deal. Um, but if you can avoid it, because you never know that your body is not 100%. I mean, it's not going to be the same today. It's not, may not be the same or yesterday. You just don't know. Um, so a lot of times it's kind of good to just avoid any kind of interaction if possible. So mm -hmm. you, you, you won't find out the hard way. Because <laughs> okay. I mean, a lot of people have a penicillin, penicillin uh, reaction, allergy, um, and then you may not have it. It's, you know, you just don't know. Um, so a lot of times if you had it as a child, you just won't take penicillin uh, for the rest of your life. In that case, even if you may have grown out of the allergy cell, mm -hmm. it's best to stay clear. And I mean, I'm not a beats person, so I can see not worrying about that. <laughs> yeah, me well, some people are. They enjoy eating them for some reason. So. <laughs> right, right. Me either. So, okay. Um, so now, side effects uh -huh. is things that you know just kind of have an adverse effect on a person, even though they're taking a medication. Is it safe to say, Doctor Tish, that any medication you take? Uh, is having is going to have some profound if not minute effect on your organs within your body is that something that we would say to to individuals is that appropriate um well that's why a lot of people do not want to take medications <laughs> right <laughs> because right. okay medications aren't good um you know it's not natural but you know this, this is a god fearing show so i mean the, God gave humans, gave man the knowledge to make medications. Uh, with that being said, um, 
medications are a good thing. It's nothing to shy away from. Of course, as anything, be educated on what you're taking. That's number one. Um, but yes, you, you may have side effects. I mean, Tylenol, the most simple of medications, they can be side effects. I even say, if you look Google water, you probably won't even drink water if you Google that. That's not a medication per se, but any medication, if you really dig deep into it, you can get a little, you know, a version to not wanting to take it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're gonna have side effects. It just depends, as we say in pharmacy school, will the utility of the drug outweigh the risk? But a lot of times it's not that um, profound of a deal. The medication is gonna do so much more. Mm -hmm. um, then this, which is usually something that can be resolved in two to three weeks once the body kind of get adjusted to the medication. Okay, so it does take that amount of time probably for one body to respond to any medication that's consumed. Like two not wrong, body, not responding wise, but if let's say for example you're on uh, medication uh, like a uh, antidepressant. Um, and you're not going, you're going to get all of the bad parts of it. You may get the drowsiness, you may get the up and down in the moods from it, um, before you even get the uh, best part of the medication, the effects of it. Um, so a lot of times that's why we probably have a higher rate of depression and anxiety because the medications really take that two to three mark to really show if it's going to be effective or not. Meanwhile, you're getting all of the bad side effects. Mm -hmm. Um, so... Yep. Yeah, um, you just have to, you know, you just have to be educated. You have to trust your healthcare provider. Yeah, yeah that's that's a really the main thing. You have to have that relationship and that rapport. Um, if there's a, you know, a, a pharmacist or a doctor that's just kind of brushing you off, you're not going to have that confidence and you're not going to have that trust to keep going forward with your therapy as you should. But if you have a really good doctor and they say, you know, they let you know in advance. This, you know, is going to be your side effect, but push through, and it's going to be okay at the end of it. Um, then that's fine. If they're saying be open to, you know, if there's going to be an issue um, with the medication, um, that you know, be, you know, let me know immediately. Um, you know, if they have that openness about it, then that'd be great too. But a lot of times, you know, that that communication and that that trust is not there for the patient, so that's why it kind of, you know. Yeah. Get lost. Yeah, trust is critical because if I have a doctor, and, and, and a lot of times that trust is hard to establish because if I see a doctor um, and he's rushing me off because he got 20 patients lined up and he's only with me 15 minutes and he's like, okay, well, you got, you know, I'm boom, boom, I'm you in and out. You know, that's that's a difficult thing to establish a trust for someone. Um, right. and so I do understand what you're saying about the trust. Um, how what would you suggest if there is a situation where a person needs medication but they don't have a trust for that particular uh, healthcare professional? What would you suggest that they do, if I may? I mean, I tell patients all the time, change. It's, not, it's, too, many patients, it's too many doctors out there for that. And, um, you know, with my, you know, when I was younger, I was, you know, probably more confident, even not confident, but, you know, like, okay, it's time to move on. But, you know, I call it now in my older years, caring wisdom. You know, when I talk to someone, they're talking, but I'm kind of sizing them up. I'm like, okay, you know, do they really mean what they say? Or are they not telling me all the information? And you keep talking until you get everything out of that patient. And usually at the end, that's when you get that jewel that makes the whole difference of how you treat that patient. Um, yeah, definitely change, change the doctor. I think personally it's ridiculous, you know, you kind of, leave a doctor's office and you don't know what you don't even know what your diagnosis is and we see that a lot this is i mean as as healthcare you know, professionals we have to have that caring wisdom because what's the point of doing it if we're not serving the patient and taking care of them to be you know their improve their quality of life there's no point yeah that's true but see and sometimes I, people have been with the doctor for such a long period of time that they don't want to change even though it may be in their best interest to change you know move on to another right. or, or they may have four or five healthcare professionals because they have four or five comorbidities and so they are you know seeing these different doctors 
one doctor is telling them one thing, another doctor is telling them another thing. They're not in in cons in cohesion together, not talking to each other, not communicating. I've been in the hospital many times and I've seen it. You know, I'm like, you know, this doctor is doing this and, and the other doctor don't know what he's doing. Or this doctor, you know what I really, and I'm going to say this, I have an issue with, as a medical professional, a healthcare professional, with a okay. doctor that is uh -huh. a, a, a medical professional. Some doctors are just like internal medicine, right? So they can okay. prescribe for any ailment, if I'm, if I'm correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. They can prescribe yes. for any ailment, but I got a psych issue, and you're going to you know, start prescribing me some psych medication. But my thing is, why would you not send this patient to the psych doctor? Because he's the specialist for psych. He's the one who knows. Right. So uh, I've seen it a lot where there's doctors giving people medication, and they really should have sent this person to their, you know, the specialist because they're 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 getting monies or whatever way it, you know it's going. But I just had an issue with that, uh, seeing it working in many hospitals. I had some concern about. It. I just wanted to bring that up. Sometimes with psych patients, you know, it's you kind of like catch them though, <laughs> because if they come to you. It, it, and then, you know, with the healthcare system, a lot of times you have to go to that generalized doctor first and then get a referral. Um, and then sometimes, you know, a lot of insurances don't want to get into all of that. But if, you, if a psych patient finally comes to you to tell you, I need help, you kind of want to, don't want to redirect them because they may not go. <laughs> you know, so a lot of times, yeah. So if you can catch them right then and there. And, you know, because doctors, they go through so much stuff. So they... They, they know, you know, pretty much, especially internal doctors, they have to go through the residency programs and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, you, they have a pretty good handle on all disease states pretty much. But when it gets out of control, like let's say it's a schizophrenia involved, then, you know, definitely come to, you know, get a more um, in-depth professional involved in that case. But, yeah. right. Well, I've seen them continue to change medication for that person, you know, like, okay, this one didn't work, so I'm going to try this one, you know what I mean? And I'm like, uh, if it's not working and you're not really clear about it and this is not your specialty, send them to the, you know, person who is responsible for that. But that's just my own uh, pet peeve, if you will. So I just want to get that in. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit, and, and uh, we have another person on the line with us, one of my church members. So. Ms. Harris, I know you're there. I see you there. If you have some comments, please chime in and and because I know that you may have some questions. So and anyone who's listening, if you have some questions, type it in the comments or type it in the chat if you're on with us, and we will make sure that your question is responded to uh, in a timely manner. Um, so medication reconciliation. Uh, mm -hmm. it's an area that uh, has, I think it's evolved in my eyes over the years because I know that back in the day, it was not a, a universal tool, if you will, to, right. you know, monitor medication and to know the interactions and that type of thing of medications. So are you able to touch a little bit on that, will you, for us, Ms. Tish, Dr. Tish? Okay. So you're referring to um, this patients who may have prescriptions at one place and at other place and how do you know what's going on with that one patient? <laughs> right. And, and, and they may they may have uh, several different medications, uh, okay. but then they may have one medication from this doctor and then another medication from another doctor. But I think here recently they have a, a system where you can go in and see, you know, every medication that this particular person has been prescribed is a statewide, if I'm correct, and that's in California. Now, you're not in California, so I don't know if they have it in other states, but if uh, you call correctly, it's a statewide uh, program. All right, you're probably um, referring to like the opioids or something to make sure. Um, either way, with the reconciliation in general, yeah, um, the thing is with insurance companies, <laughs> a lot of times we use an insurance, so even if the patient goes to a lot of different pharmacies, um, it's going to pull. <laughs> And so let's say you get a, a blood pressure medication from um, this place, one pharmacy, and then you come to you know my pharmacy or something like that. Um, the insurance company is going to let us know the interaction. So like you're saying, basically, 
because of the um, the networking and the um, technology is so much better. Like back when I first started, it was it was kind of sketchy. Yes, <laughs> I remember because it was, I was I remember that where they they didn't have a system where they knew that a person was taking something and different people were you know getting different medications and there was no uh, way to track interaction and that type of thing. That that had right. a bad situation for some people. Right, yeah, you had to use your good old-fashioned brain back in the day. So now we're kind of spoiled. <laughs> like right. if someone asks an like, interaction or something, I'm like, uh, be right back and go to the computer. <laughs> uh, but back in my day, yeah, we had to have all that that stuff in our brain. Is, you know, that, yeah, so. Um, yeah. yeah, but it was, we had to really rely on the patient and the caregiver to give us the information because if you happen to go to different doctors, as you're saying, and different pharmacies on top of that, you don't have a clue. You have to take your word for it. All we can do is go from what we see in our computer system. Right. right. So, yes. Yeah, so today is much, it's much more safe, as you're saying, with the interactions, um, with the duplication, um, therapeutic duplication is so much more um, safe now because it's all much more connected because of technology. So that is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, really it is because there's been right. some situations, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, let's see. So outdated medications, let's talk about that a little bit. I know sometimes, and I've been, I've, I've done this myself, I'm not gonna say I haven't, where I have medication that I've been prescribed, like say for instance, I had a procedure done, they gave me uh -huh. some medication for pain. Well, I didn't take it all, of course. And so I kind of kept it, so if I ever needed it, I would, you know, be able to take it. Uh, but, but a lot of times we keep medication that's outdated and we can right. to use that medication. So is that uh, something would you would be able to touch on about, you know, what the, the pros and cons of that, if you will? Um, well, the only pro I can think of, as you were saying, I mean, you paid your money, basically. <laughs> you, <didn't say> basically. <laughs> you paid your money. I mean, I'm guilty of that, too. I mean, I'm probably grief. Got like a library of stuff in here. <laughs> right. From like, life. And I just don't like, I don't know. I was like, my stuff. I don't know. But um, yes, you just, uh, it's, it's not safe because a lot of times, you know, like let's say you have grandchildren that come over and you don't have it, you know, the, the proper capping on the prescription bottle and they get into it. That's a problem. Medication you don't even take anymore. They can get into it. Or let's say you do have that pain medication and you have someone that's coming into your home to like, uh, you know, fix a handyman work or something and you step out and they may, you know, rummage around and find something in your medicine cabinet in your bathroom and they take it, you know, it's, you know, because, you know, opioid crisis or grandchildren. So I've heard a lot of different scenarios of medications are, that aren't being used, that are just kind of hanging around and other people get into it. Children, um, adults, people, outsiders. So that's definitely the con of it, just in general. Right. Um, a lot of times I keep it mingled with the medications they are supposed to take, and they kind of pre like they don't know what to take anymore. They miss and dump it all in their medication planner, and they call on us with like 26 pills to identify because they don't know what what you know they don't understand what's going on anymore. <laughs> right. So that just keeps us pretty busy at the pharmacy, you know, identifying like. 10,000 pills. <laughs> right, right. I, I was just, right. uh, what you were saying, I was thinking about working in the hospital and there was this one patient that came. Mm -hmm. and he had taken his, he was in, this is just a, throwing this out here. He had taken mm -hmm. his medication two or three times in the same mm -hmm. day. So he mm -hmm. the hospital, he went to the emergency room, he went upstairs they had him in the hospital for a while and then he came down to where I was working and I won't even say where I was working because I don't want to incriminate nobody but right. down there and I was like okay so he took his medication the same medication three or four times in the same day mm -hmm. that's a red flag right up there for, for me okay I'm like so well, something is wrong right so I'm right. the patient and I asked the patient I said so were you, did you take this medication? Were you trying to, you know, commit suicide or what were you trying to do? You know, I, I had a conversation with him right. and he, that he didn't want to live. 
And so, and I was so concerned because he got from, he came in the emergency room, uh -huh. in the hospital. He went, you know, through the hospital and then he came to where I was at, you know, where I was working. Right. Nobody had addressed it. And he had seen a social worker and I'm like, okay, what's going on? You know, when you have a patient, and this is me from a, a social work perspective now, you have a patient, they've taken their medication three or four times, two things or something is wrong. Either they're not being monitored and supervised as they should because they may have some dementia or some cognitive deficit, right. or they are trying to go home. They're trying to commit suicide. And so right. for me, it was like nobody picked that up and I was so concerned. And so what happened was this particular patient, he, uh, they didn't, <laughs> It was a trip because the, the medical professionals, I won't say any, any names, that I was working with, they didn't want me to do what I do, okay? Because I was like, okay, no, he took this medication three or four times and he didn't tell me he wanted to kill himself. Well, you know, he doing right. 50, exactly. right. he 50 times for me, you know? And so mm -hmm. they they fixed it. They didn't, they didn't let it happen that way. And I was really concerned about that patient because we were going to send that patient particularly to a geriatric psych, okay? Because they got gero psych, you guys know that. Uh, okay. Psych unit for, for elderly people who don't want to live. They need oh, yeah. to go to 5150 in a geriatric psych, but they, they didn't do that. And so that was just something that popped in my head when you talked about people taking medication because a lot mm -hmm. of times it just takes somebody to talk to them and, and say what's going on, you know? And, he, right. and I know he had talked to many people in that place where he was. Right. He yes. didn't reveal what he was really thinking until he got to me. And I was, I was really concerned about that. I, I just thought about that and that came to my mind. That's what you call caring wisdom. Yeah. Like, you know, it has all through all, all the other professionals. Yeah. So if you care wisdom, it doesn't matter what you know. Your knowledge base means absolutely nothing right. if you care of, enough to share what we were taught. Right. That's what, yeah, so that's what you greatly displayed. Really and you, you know, may have helped him down the line. That's all he probably needed to someone to actually care and not just pass him off. Right, right, right. So, yeah, yeah. May, may I add a, a, an additional question? Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, the other concern is uh, the proper way uh, when people have large amounts of medication just kind of sitting around. The right. proper way to dispose of uh, medication because I've heard some very interesting things and then I've heard that there's a professional way to do it in terms of um, that you're to take it at a certain time of the year to a disposal place and dispose right. that way but is there a because I've heard coffee grinds are good uh, dish soap all kinds of things but I've been told that the medication gets back into our water system and we don't want to right. use those uh, disposal methods. So uh, as a pharmacist, what do you suggest as the uh, correct and proper way to dispose of medication? Okay, great question. Um, so we do have a lot of people that will pass bags of medication to the pharmacy. And uh, I know usually where I work, we don't handle it at, a, at any kind of pharmacy level. Um, what we do, um, help with we have like little packets it's called dispose rx um it's, i wish i had one around but either way it's a it's a packet where you put half of it in a pill bottle you um, fill it up with water you shake up the pill bottle and you toss it so it basically neutralizes the medication um okay. and, I, and you can get it from the pharmacist right yeah you can get it from us um it's limited uh but yes you can uh, you probably can get it online so actually, I'm trying to team up with the company to get free ones. Um, so whenever I um, get an answer back from the company, I'll get back with Dr. Jackson and yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, but we do also suggest, um, from what we were understanding in my area, Charlotte, the fire department um, takes them to be disposed of. So as you were saying, um, Dr. Jackson, they do have like an annual yearly um, disposal, um, especially with narcotics and stuff of that nature. Um, but usually on a regular basis, like the fire department or the um, police department usually takes them and they dispose of them, from what I understand. 
Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's a good information. So if a person needs to dispose of medication, they can take it to their local police station or fire department? Right. That's right. In my area, that's why definitely now. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a countrywide thing. Uh, but like I said, in the pharmacies, we do have a little disposable, um, it's like in a little Kool-Aid packet. <laughs> um, and you can usually um, get rid of two bottles of uh, prescriptions with one pack. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. that's, no, I didn't know that. I want to get back to that because I'm trying to um, get with the, com well, I've contacted the company to get some free samples. Well, that's not samples, but free so I can just give it out to everyone. Okay, that'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, so mm -hmm. I have a, we have a question in the chat. Uh, what to do if you can't afford your medication? <sighs> I know. It's so hard. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's something. Um, Okay, so especially when it's like diabetes and, for example, I know Walmart Pharmacy, they have the $4 list, which mm -hmm. is, just, is amazing. I mean, they kind of change the whole landscape of um, the medicals um, the, the, when it comes to medications. They just, I just love it. So um, it's, it's, there's a list. Um, they have like the $4 medications. So let's say if you are not higher um, cost of blood pressure medication, a lot of times you can talk to your doctor, uh, let them know about the $4 list, which everyone knows about, and they can switch it over to one of the medications on the $4 list. So can you say that again? What do you call it? A four what? On um, the $4 list, you know, with Walmart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I couldn't, I wasn't clearing it. So Walmart is the only, but they're the only facility that does this. The only. Uh, yeah. No. Um, uh, we the one the Walmart is the one that started it, but it's not the only one. Um, some of the mom and pop pharmacies have adopted the four dollar list, and the list changes from um, from company to company. So it's you know like not really a standard four dollar list. It just depends on the company. Yeah, um, you know your Harris Teeter, your Publix. I believe like your Publix, um, they have like free antibiotics. Um, during certain seasons, so this is you just got to really do your research um, to see because it's out there. But the main thing is, if you're like on the the main medication, like your blood pressure diabetes um, medications, um, like metformin, for example, for diabetes, that's like on like the four dollars. Um, so that's just amazing. Um, to, you know, for that. Um, another resource. Um, so like I said, with you know, you talk to your doctor, let them know. Can I change my high um, cost of medication to the one on the four dollars? If they feel it's okay, they'll change it. If not, then they just won't. So a lot of times, that's how pharmacies we can also help out. We just don't give up with uh, medication and medical information. We want you to actually take your medications and get better. So if you just talk to us, we can make those phone calls and let the doctor know hey, this medication is not cost effective for the patient, can we change it to X, Y, and Z medication? Um, so yeah, we do that. Uh, we do that a lot actually for the patients. So doctors, they don't really know the cost. I mean, we're there all the time. They don't know, they just write stuff. Um, and if they don't mind, they'll, they'll take out suggestions and change it. One other thing, it's an app called, uh, it's called GoodRx. I mean, have you ever heard of that before? I think I, I have. have. Yeah, I think I've heard of it. Okay, that is not to be taken for granted. It is an amazing um, app. You can get it on your phone or pull it up online. And basically, uh, it's not like any kind of subscription or anything. But let's say you're at the pharmacy and your medication is just like, like wow. So you just pull up um, the medication on GoodRx, put in the strength, and they'll give you like the discounted price and that pharmacy will honor it um, at the pharmacy for that cost. Okay. So, yeah, I've yeah. seen the commercials for it. So yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm glad to know that it yeah. actually yeah. does what it says it can. Right. Yeah, this, it's just like for two or three hundred dollars that come down to like, like $10. It's, it's, so it's really good. Yeah, so that's not just you, you just don't know. You just have to try that one out. You don't know how it's going to play out, but that's a really good resource. Also, a lot of times, um, let's say if you want an expensive inhaler, 
uh, a lot of times you can contact a company and they can give you a coupon. So I've, I've had that happen before where patients um, get like free medications because they contact the actual company, do like a survey and they can get like a code for like a free a mailer for like a couple of months. So it's just all about doing the research, but pharmacists can definitely help with your, um, with your medication when it comes to cost, because we know the resources. Okay, good. So, and, and just to piggyback on that, if you will, if you are indigent and you don't have any insurance, then mm -hmm. you can always get into uh, applying for Medi-Cal. Um, oh, yeah. uh, low income individual. And it's Medi-Cal in California, it's Medicaid in other states, but right. uh, it's important that you know that if you do have a need for medication and you do not have money or insurance coverage, then you can always put in for Medi-Cal. Uh, and I don't know if all medications are covered by Medi-Cal. Most are. Uh, but if you're Medicare and if you're medi, medi then you're basically covered across the board. If you have Medicare and Medi-Cal or Medicaid, you're covered across the board. So just be cognizant of that, uh, that it is, you know, uh, other than the, the $4 list, which I've never heard of, thank God for that. And the, or, I know medication can be expensive. You have, you have Walmarts um, in the area in uh, California? So I'm sorry? You have Walmarts in the area? In yes, yes ma'am. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's for the dollar list. Yeah, they, like I said, even like Harris Teeter, I'm not sure if you have it there, or Publix. Yeah, they have definitely a $4 list is a good thing. And one more thing I thought about, like I know from the Charlotte area, they're like nonprofits. Um, so let's say you're not on the Medicaid just yet, but something happened and you need medication. You have nonprofits that can help you out with that. So like in the Charlotte area, is something called like um, in, uh, Narcona Assist, Med Assist. And basically it's just a nonprofit uh, where they have like a pharmacy to fill your prescriptions for like little to no cost. Yeah, I recall uh, when in one of my employers, there was a patient that had some medication he needed and it was a thousand dollars a day to take this medication. Yeah, it was, it was high. And I was like, okay. So the, they found a company that paid for his medication. He had, I believe he had cancer and they, yeah. only, the only medication he could get was that thousand dollars a day medication and That's they sad. gave him that medication. Okay. And I was wow. like, thank God for these, you know, this company, because, you know, heaven forbid that, you know, he couldn't get it, you know? So um, right. there are some uh, entities out there, uh, nonprofit and different organizations that will support uh, if the medication is extremely expensive and right. not able to access it. You may not be eligible for Medi-Cal. You may be moderate to low income where you're in that fine line in between and you yeah. don't have the means to do it. Uh, please, you know, say something uh, to someone at the hospital or a medical right. professional that you need some help. Don't just, you know, not take the medication because it's too expensive. Because nine times out of ten, if it's a life-sustaining medication, they're going to make sure that you have it. So I just oh, want yeah. to bring that up, okay? Yeah, just yeah. say something to somebody. Um, exactly. And like I said, we don't want to deal with the medication, so if you just definitely talk to us, yeah, we can, you know, like I said, find you the drug company's name and number, you know, help you make that phone call to get it for free. So, yeah, so like you said, definitely don't go without because that's just making the situation worse. And always ask the question. Don't think, oh, yes. I can't say nothing. They're going to look at me funny. If you yes. need help, say something because nine times out of 10, somebody out there will help you. Okay. Right. All right. So now let's talk. I'd like to make a comment. Yes, please. Go ahead, Ms. Harris. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. I had, an eye, I had an eye doctor who prescribed to me a medication that when I tried to fill it, it was a few hundred dollars for a deep eye drop. Ms. Harris, you're mm -hmm. So when I mentioned you're fading in and out can you when i mentioned it to the doctor mm -hmm. he told me it was a compound medicine it was two medicines in one okay 
but when he made it two separate prescriptions uh -huh. for each of those medications, it came out to be like $10 for one and zero okay for the other. Right, excellent point, that is true, right. So sometimes the, the, the compound medicine uh, can be very pricey. Exactly. But you may have to take two different medications, but if price is your issue, that could help if you would just mention the price to your, your doctor. Right, that is, that's an excellent point, yes. We do that um, at the pharmacy as well. Like um, Ms. Harris is saying, if you have a medication, a lot of times the technology to combine the medications can drive up the cost. So a lot of times we can talk to the doctor and get them to break it down to the two separate medications, which are still equal and effective. Um, it's less convenient, but like you know, Ms. Harris was saying, cost is an issue is no problem is taking two tablets at one time or using two drops at one time versus not taking them at all so that's an excellent point that is true right right miss harris did that answer your question or do you have any other comment about that or is that it no that's pretty much it other than what i've noticed with one of my medications is uh, it was one price one month, but the refill had gone up. I'll give an example. It was $37, and the next refill was $380 something dollars. Ooh, uh -huh. goodness. And uh, I, it was like for a, for a, 90 day supply. Okay. So I asked, could they break it down? Uh -huh. And maybe I could afford it if it was like um, a third of that. Uh, instead of the 90 days, it was 30 days. Okay. And they, I was told that they couldn't do that. Okay. They couldn't do that. They wasn't allowed to to break it down. That was interesting because before COVID, uh -huh. uh, they would break it down for me. Okay. But now they won't. They said they're not allowed to break it down. Yeah, it sounds like some kind of insurance, um, something with the insurance company. Um, and, you know, it the insurance company is, and when when you talk to the insurance company about mm -hmm. it which i did and they say well you're in a different tier now okay and your out of pocket will have to be such and such before you move to yeah. another tier so right. it's uh of course the pharmacy always tells you to check with your insurance to see you know why the price difference Mm -hmm. uh, but the insurance companies usually, it's not not helpful, especially right. with certain chronic illnesses and the medications needed for those chronic illnesses like diabetes and high blood pressure, right. because they know that people would pay what they need to survive on those medications and so they're not willing to to help you out and if those programs you're talking about that uh these pharmaceutical companies will help you when i've looked into those they are income qualified and if you have insurance already they're not willing to help you Oh. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, with Medicare. It's really for low-income people with little or no insurance. Those are the ones they will help. But if you have insurance that will not cover the medication that you have, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, you won't qualify for the discounts uh, or the help that they can give. 
that's been my experience. Right. And um, I'm assuming that's with Medicare. Um, yeah, when it comes to insurances, and that's what makes our job just really not um, the best. <laughs> uh, because we have what we, you know, we have what patients need to get better. Um, but then insurance, you know, we have to go through insurance companies. And that's personally, we have to deal with our own insurances. Um, and with Medicare, you are correct. Uh, a lot of times, if you are on Medicare, and let's say you have an expensive inhaler, and then there's a coupon that can possibly bring it down to zero copay or even like $25, uh, Medicare does not allow any other help. And, I, and it's something I can't explain. It doesn't make sense because I believe if you're on Medicare, then you should get all of the benefits that is owed to you, but they don't allow it. And then as you're saying with your donut hole, um, you get to a, a certain price point rather, where you have to kind of pay out of it before you, it goes back to your copay. So as you were saying, one month it was like, what, three or $4 possibly, then the next month it's like $300. So it's just, you know, this is, the insurance gets really intricate and uh, whenever it's enrollment time, you know, those are the questions to ask the uh, Medicare agent, you know, to see how to better navigate through that. And, uh, you know, this was, more, this was more cost effective. But usually in a case like that, you have to pay either at the front end or at the back end when it comes to Medicare. It's, just, it's always just, yes. <laughs> so I'm sorry you've gone through that. We see that every day at work at um, the pharmacy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so. But to, check, to give some um, hope, I did have a patient that uh, was on the Medicare um, and on the good RX, the cost was way less. So, it was, you know, Medicare was not used and then they could use the good RX. So I did have, um, have seen that. So, you know, just really doing the research and you know, just navigating around it. You know, everyone's looking out for their best interests and as patients, we have to look out for our best interests as well. Okay, that's important, yes, definitely, definitely. Okay, so now, um, I wanna talk a little bit about drug seeking because uh -huh. it is a big area that, and, and first, well, before we talk about the drug seeking, uh, you mentioned when we were talking earlier, Dr. Tish, about uh, COVID. How has COVID-19, the coronavirus, uh, impacted your work with regard to pharmacy? How has it impacted it, if, if at all? Um, it just, um, hold on, looks like my battery's going to go low. Uh -oh. um, it's, I mean, uh, all I have to say, <laughs> All I can say about it is if people, uh, you know, you just have to make sure and take your medications properly. Because um, with the COVID, a lot of the issues were the underlying disease states. You have the diabetes, you have the asthma, you have the high blood pressure. And unfortunately, that COVID can really just come in and cause havoc. Um, so, you know, taking your medication properly, that's what we kind of taught everyone, um, you know, just, you know, have the best sanitary practices. I've never seen so many people that were interested in hand sanitizers. I'm like, what were we all doing before? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't want any soap now. Like, what's, what were we doing? But, uh, it's effort now, huh? What's that now? We're making a conscious effort now to yes. sanitize. Yeah. All right, but thing is when a pandemic like this do happen you know if your health is you know we all have issues with our health you know unfortunately not everyone but you know more than not um take medications pro properly that's not get to a point where you're taking it every other day or every week and then a pandemic happens and then something can seep in and kind of you know feed off of the you know your underlying disease states you know, because you have an issue, that doesn't mean it has to be an issue. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. And another piece of that too is eating healthy. Um, right. You're eating a bunch of stuff that you shouldn't be eating. I'm going to call it junk, if you will. Uh, right. You know, 
you can't expect to have the best outcome if you do contract some type of a virus or some type of, you know, uh, some type of ailment um, because your body is going to respond to what you're putting in it. And that's with regard to your medication. That's with regard to drinking water. That's with regard to your food intake. And, and me, myself, just speaking of myself, and, and uh, I don't eat too much of, of things that don't have chemicals in it. Cause, and my food bill is higher. But I, I try to eat food that's organic and non-GMO because it is not a joke out there. And they're putting these hamburger stands on each corner, this Taco Bell, these, you know, Jack in the Box. And, you know, when we, we're busy, we're running around doing our thing, we stop, oh, let me grab something to eat from here. No, that's just not going to cut it. So the medication, right. the managing your meds and eating healthy and uh, exercise and all of those things come into play when you are right. dealing with this uh, the invisible stressor that we have called the covid yeah, and that COVID it really it really exposed it. It really showed how we really need to take care of ourselves. Right. I mean, I work at a pharmacy. I work with all these different types of people, all these germs. But you know, I take my vitamins. I mean, I had open heart surgery and everything. So if anyone's going to get COVID and have a problem, it would be me. Um, but if you take your vitamins, I'm not saying I eat the best, but you know, whatever you do, I'm doing, and I haven't. God bless, have not had any issues. Uh, with the COVID. So, you know, that could be luck or just could be, you know, just doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but yeah, just take your medications and, you know, if there's side effects that's causing issues, don't put up with it. And or just don't give up. Let your pharmacist know and we can call your doctor for you if that's a barrier. It's, there's no barriers. Um, you know, it's, it's something that can be resolved because you don't have to put up with anything that's not comfortable. There are too many medications out there, too, you know, too many medications that are designed that can be fit for that person, that right person. So that's why they make so many of one type of medications. It's like a million blood pressure medications, just, you know, just to tailor it for, you know, everyone. Right. The best, so. Right, right. Okay. So then, then I mentioned about drug seeking, because I know that. Um, that's the area and the opioid crisis and the distribution of the opioids. That is a big right. thing nowadays. So you want to touch a little bit on that, if you will, Dr. Tish? Yeah, that, that's some kind of world off of that. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah um, now it's, 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 it's no games anymore with that. It's right. now, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard about the veins that, you know, packed with people that go all the way to Ohio to see that one doctor, or they go to Myrtle Beach or South Carolina. It's just, yeah, I mean, people are killing themselves. You know, it's just, you know, there's all that anxiety, depression, you know, PTSD, you know, and people, you know, self-medicate or they just, it's just, it's, yes. <laughs> so yeah, the opioid crisis is, it is very real. I mean, I've, like I said, I started in a pharmacy since I was 16 years old, and I've just seen how things were normalized and how it just kind of crept up into this big, you know, explosion of needing narcotics. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's just because of the, um, you know, everything boils down to money. I mean, but that's probably for another show. Uh, you know, just, you know, the right people can pump out the right type of medications and put the right name to it and the right marketing and you know, it just, just make it much more available. Um, but yeah, that's it's a real thing. But pharmacies, doctors, we are all working together to uh, bring it to a resolve. And I think it's um, helping a lot. And you're, from, from what you're seeing as a social worker, how's, how's it looking to you? Is it getting any better, you think, or no? No, it's not getting better. I do okay. miss, though, I do know that they are monitoring the prescriptions. I do, uh -huh. they're making sure that specific doctors that prescribe opioids are not able to prescribe a certain amount. I do that, that is monitored from what I understand very heavily. Yes. Uh, and it's funny because I went to uh, see this doctor and she had a big sign on her wall 
we do not fill prescriptions for opioids. And I was like, oh, she made it real clear. So what I'm thinking, okay, I got some pain. You got to give me what I need. But no, you know, a lot of people, a lot of doctors, a lot of medical professionals will not fill those prescriptions anymore. Um, I do work in the prison. Um, uh -huh. and the crisis is everywhere. I'm just going to say that. I'm not going to go into any detail, but it is, uh -huh. it is something. It is you know, the crisis for the opioid is something. Right. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's a bad thing because, like you're saying, you, you may need medications. I mean, but it's kind of hard to say because I have friends that are out of the country that have, like, breast cancer, and all they want to get is a Motrin. <laughs> they tell me all they get is Motrin when they have their breast removed. They're like, what? You're giving them so yeah, but uh, yeah, like I had a friend like in the Middle East. <laughs> oh God! That's, yeah, that's it. You may get a tramadol. <laughs> you may. Wow. Yeah, you know. So you know, pain tolerance is, you know, seems like in that case is a cultural. It is not here. Now they none of that over there. Of course, they have the issues too. Um, but it, it is it is hard to see um, that the good has to suffer with the bad. Um, but, you know, the pharmacy, we're, you know, they have a lot of controls in place to kind of keep the doctors, you know, we all just work on it together. Um, we're trying to be reasonable. Um, from what I'm seeing, we don't see too many prescriptions coming through anymore um, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that are passing through that are um, fake or anything, forgeries or anything of that nature. That has greatly come down because we used to get them all the time. It was just... And they were getting better at it, too. It was almost impressive. <laughs> I'm not sure they're getting the same computer. They steal the pad. They got the computer system. It's just, yeah. But, um, yeah, you, and the thing is, with the fentanyl, that's what really made things very unpredictable. Because a speck of fentanyl can be mixed with a regular medication and is, you just can die. You know, young people can lose their life before they even started. Yeah. You know, just one bad mistake. Or not even thinking they're making, you know, a mistake. This, this, this. Oh, it's, but yeah, it's, it's definitely. Yeah, like you were saying, it is very heavily controlled. Like everyone is connected, um, computer system wise, so we can see everyone who gets controlled from any area now, and that is amazing. So they did do a great upgrade on that. Does that go across states, Dr. Tish? That that particular. Right. System, it goes, it's in the United States, so it's in any state. So if I go from one state to the other and I get a prescription in, let's say, your state, and I come to California and I try to get another prescription, then you would, the person here would have access to that information to know that I had a prescription filled in another state for that same medication. Is that correct? Right. A, a lot of times, yes. Of course, there are glitches, or if a name is somewhat tweaked differently, of course, if we run into that. Um, but yes, now a lot of times, um, you, well, from all the states, you can see when someone gets a prescription. So that really ruins a lot of parties. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the saddest part about it is that the people that really need it, that are really in pain, right. they can't get it. Because this friction right. on it so heavily that, you know, it's like, you know, people come to me, oh, I got pain, I got this, I got that, and they won't give me the medication. I'm like, yeah. It's sad. It really is. Right. So it's something. Yeah, especially, um, I mean, like I said, now, like at the beginning of the crisis, it was really bad because all of the pharmacists, all of the doctors, we were just hands off. We just didn't want to deal with it. And, you know, because everyone's getting sued. Like we didn't know I wanted to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, but now yeah. everything's kind of relaxed because now we have to use our professional judgment. If someone's in hospice, we're not going to harass someone who is at their end of life. Right. We're not going to a caregiver and not give that caregiver the medication to give the patient because we are afraid of the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's still a human being. It's still a single person that needs care. So you just have to take it on a person-by-person -person basis and, you know, hopefully you find someone who uses their professional judgment and show that kind of wisdom. Right, right. And, and I'm just going to uh, uh, mention this as well. Sometimes caregivers mm -hmm. uh, taking the medication from the patient uh, because yeah. we have an addiction issue, if you will. Um, right. We have run across that as well, where, you know, my, 
my caregiver took all my medication, you know, and it really makes it really ugly for the other person or for the patient, right. your loved one. So um, once again, let me just mention, if you have some questions or comments, please type it in the comments section and we will respond to you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Caregiver Chronicles right quick. It's a 16 module online course where we cover all areas of caregiving from the onset of your loved one's illness all the way until their transition. Um, first and foremost, Dr. Tish, is there anything you want to say to the audience that's listening in tonight um, as we close out? Because you have been just a jewel and a wealth of information for us. Um, uh -huh. I want to just allow you a platform to, you know, just mention your project as well, uh, if you will. Yeah, um, well, uh, as, I have a company called Ask Pharmacist Tish. Ask Pharmacist Tish. Um, I have a Facebook page. And basically, if you have any questions, um, you can private message me and I will just answer you, of course, free of charge. And, you know, just my thing is I just, I enjoy people. I've been a patient myself personally. I had my mom who was a caregiver for me. So I kind of see how it is as a patient. And, you know, that made me much more sensitive to the needs of the patient. Um, so, you know, so I've been through it. So my main thing is I just want everyone to have the best quality of life because from my experience, that's the main thing, quality of life. No one should have to suffer or have to guess on what's best for them. You know, just we come together and, you know, as what you're doing, which is great, you know, we just all come together for everyone's quality of life. So I appreciate you having me here. And um, like I said, any medication questions, um, you just can always send me a direct message on my Facebook page and I'll be glad to answer them. Okay, thank you. And so if you have um, questions, you can also uh, visit our at www.caregiverchronicles247.com um, and you can email me at caregiverchronicles247 at gmail.com. Um, we'd be happy to respond to you and uh, we will see you next week. Uh, Ms. Carolyn, I want to thank you for joining in with us tonight. Ms. My Hayes, pleasure. Thank you for joining in. Is there anything you want to say, Ms. Carolyn, that would help the audience as well? Well, I I hope that they are um, using the resources that Dr. Tish has given and the resources that you've uh, offered as well, because this is free. You don't have to pay for this. And we're always looking for ways to help clients live the best quality of life possible. Yeah. So uh, this is a very good start. So I, I encourage them to take advantage of Dr. Tish and of uh, Dr. Yvette. Mm -hmm. I think they're, two primary resources that are very effective and it's a good starting place in, uh, in, in your journey for seeking whatever it is that you're seeking regarding uh, medication and caregiving. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris, for joining us also. So that's basically it for tonight. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. Um, let us help you develop your caregiver chronicles because anytime you're taking care of a loved one, you want to make sure they have the best possible care because you can be at ease knowing that you have done your best in ensuring that their well-being is maintained and managed. So God bless you. We'll see you next week on Friday Night Live. Ask Dr. Yvette anything. Thank you again. Take care now. God bless. Bye-bye.